Every man, woman, and child lives under a nuclear sword of Democles, hanging by the slenderest of threads, capable of being cut at any moment by accident or miscalculation or by madness. The weapons of war must be abolished before they abolish us. So said U.S. President John F. Kennedy in a 1961 speech before the United Nations during the Cold War. Words that echo ever more poignantly today. And while the true risk of nuclear warfare remains relatively slim, owed to the massive deterrent that is the mutually assured destruction doctrine, total nuclear war will always present a non-zero chance of occurring as long as such weapons exist. During the atomic age following World War II, when new emerging superpowers were testing these apocalyptic weapons, governments were preparing themselves as well as their military for the unimaginable scenario that is nuclear warfare. Numerous U.S. military operations took place in nuclear testing sites abroad, as well as on American soil. Pitting U.S. servicemen against these weapons in the field, the U.S. military conducted live-fire nuclear war games, the goal being to understand the physical and psychological effects of nuclear weapons on infantry during a large-scale American invasion scenario. The majority of these military servicemen had no idea what they were about to experience until just moments before it happened. This was the ordeal of those who in time would come to be known as the Atomic Soldiers. A true horror in history. In Episode 4 of Horrors in History, we looked at the devastating effects caused by nuclear weapons testing in the South Pacific Ocean by the U.S. military, namely the irradiation of large areas of the region, including inhabited islands and the United States' own military personnel, who conducted the tests. And while a whopping 67 nuclear bombs were detonated across the South Pacific waters and islands, the U.S. was simultaneously conducting numerous atomic tests on its own soil. In the southwestern state of Nevada, the military had cordoned off over 1,300 square miles of the state. Their objective, to conduct live-fire exercises with atomic bombs while practicing troop movements and other war games. This set of exercises was codenamed Desert Rock, beginning in 1951. Over the next several years, the military would conduct the exercises in phases, detonating multiple nuclear payloads, typically under one megaton or less than a thousand kilotons. The U.S. Army, accompanied by the Pentagon and the Atomic Energy Commission, hoped to gain vital data from these tests and ascertain what a real nuclear battle may look like. If the Pentagon needed to use nuclear weapons against overwhelming numbers of enemy forces, how would the U.S.'s own defending military stand up to such destructive weapons being used in their immediate vicinity? The first three phases of Desert Rock, called Operation Buster Jangle, it too was divided into multiple phases consisting of seven detonations in late 1951 at the Nevada test site. Each detonation was referred to as a shot, the largest being Shot Easy, a gravity bomb dropped from a B-45 yielding a 31 kiloton blast, roughly twice as large as Little Boy dropped on Hiroshima, Japan in World War II. Following the detonation, troops and radiological personnel moved in towards ground zero of the blast. All involved with the hazardous exercises were provided with dosimeter patches to wear on their person, meant to measure exposure levels. The issue was, many patches were simply lost or damaged, providing inaccurate real-time measurements of exposure the troops were experiencing. Furthermore, in retrospect, it was discovered that what knowledge atomic researchers had at the time may not have provided completely accurate readings regarding how much radiation the test personnel were actually being exposed to. Nevertheless, assurances were made to everyone that all safety measures were being thoroughly followed to limit harmful radiation exposure. So Desert Rock continued. While early phases of the exercise simply required the soldiers to observe and report their findings on damage caused by the blasts, Operation Tumbler Snapper of the Desert Rock 4 phase saw troops conduct actual military maneuvers during the shots. Shot George, a 15 kiloton bomb, was detonated on June 1, 1952 with a mushroom cloud reaching 37,000 feet. Immediately following the detonation and the resulting shockwave, 
tactical maneuvers were initiated. Engineering crews established communications in the blast area, while infantry troops moved in towards Ground Zero, along with a division of tanks. The George shot would become one of the dirtiest bombs tested in the continental United States, resulting in 7% of all radiological contamination of the U.S. populace of the 1,000-plus nuclear bombs tested by America. Phase 5 of Desert Rock was particularly important owing to the Grable shot, because it was one of the first tests exploring thermonuclear capabilities, vital research that would be applied in the Pacific Proving Grounds region, which was dotted with inhabited islands. There, the U.S. would test city killers. During these thermonuclear experiments, the Pacific Proving Grounds atomic soldiers experienced a whole new level of destructive power. To avoid blindness from the initial flash, observers were told to cover their eyes with their hands and remarked how they could see the bones and blood vessels through their flesh, like a physician would see on an x-ray scan. Following this disturbing sight, the shockwaves arrived and were so powerful they knocked many off of their feet. Some of these bombs even induced tsunamis up to 92 feet in height. After the shockwaves came the fireball and an overwhelming heat so intense that some observers were said to have fled in tears, calling out for their mothers. These upscale thermonuclear tests would affect many of the atomic veterans deeply, creating an existential dread from witnessing such a visceral display of apocalyptic might. Many subscribing to preconceived notions that an atomic war could be fought and won. However, the tests at the Pacific Proving Grounds showed otherwise. As one atomic veteran put it, I'd like to think it hasn't affected me. I'd like to think I can tough it out and everything's okay. It has affected me. Following the eighth phase of the Desert Rock atomic tests in the Nevada Proving Grounds, having detonated 100 atmospheric nuclear devices, the Pentagon finally decided to end the program. While claims were made that crucial findings were discovered from the data collected during the tests, Desert Rock also showcased the futility of nuclear weapons on the battlefield, despite their catastrophic stopping power. For example, it was concluded that fortified trenches with heavy overhead protection could adequately protect troops from the destructive blast of an atom bomb, dropped only a few miles away. However, the time it took to construct such defensive positions, around an hour and a half approximately, was determined to be too much time, leaving soldiers completely exposed to the bomb's dangers. Furthermore, the level of radiation exposure the soldiers endured is thought to have been greater than what they were initially led to believe. It did not help matters that radiation decontamination procedures were disturbingly minimal compared to how it is handled today. Servicemen recounted how the irradiated livestock were scrubbed down thoroughly with soap and water, while the troops were brushed down with brooms. Unfortunately, this is all that was considered to be necessary in removing radioactive contamination from exposed test personnel. And the Desert Rock soldiers weren't the only ones receiving harmful amounts of radioactive contamination during the exercises. A sharp uptick in leukemia and bone cancers in Utah and elsewhere was noted between the years 1955 to 1980 due to fallout from the Nevada nuclear tests being carried over the region by westerly winds. For the atomic soldiers, many would view the nuclear tests they participated in as just another day at the office, with most being more concerned about the typical dangers of combat rather than nuclear war. However, the true nature of the tests was not lost on some atomic veterans, who acknowledged that they felt like guinea pigs. And while many of these atomic soldiers would carry mental scars from their experience witnessing such overwhelming firepower, the majority would suffer physically as well in the years to come. As these health issues surfaced in the form of various cancers, including leukemia, they turned to the Veterans Association for assistance in compensating medical bills. The VA promptly turned them away after conferring with the Department of Defense, who continued to insist soldiers were not exposed to excessive amounts of radiation during nuclear combat exercises or nuclear cleanup efforts. To make matters worse, the VA had drawn up a list of qualifying cancers, and if an affected veteran did not have that particular kind of cancer, they would be ineligible for medical aid. 
By 1990, the U.S. passed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, awarding all eligible atmospheric nuclear test veterans a lump sum of $75,000 each. In 1994, the Clinton administration created the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments, tasked with investigating nuclear testing between 1946 and 1974. The committee uncovered instances of gross negligence, with acting officials at the time negating any procedures or policies of obtaining consent from service members and being subjected as guinea pigs for nuclear experimentation. Efforts continue in the courts and on Capitol Hill today to properly compensate these veterans and their families. President Biden signed legislation in 2022 called the PACT Act, which greatly expands eligibilities for military veterans exposed to toxic chemicals while on duty. Though for many of the atomic soldiers, this feels like a development that is too little, too late. For all the sacrifices they perceived will be made on their part for their country, the secretive designation as human lab rats for nuclear war experimentation was likely not within anyone's expectations. An experience that has led to a life of sickness, death, and frustration towards the government of the country they proudly served during a time of paradigm-shifting developments in the art of war. Making the ordeal of the atomic soldiers a true horror in history. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe, especially if you are new to the channel. The majority of our viewers have not yet subscribed, so please consider doing so today, where you can be informed whenever we do release new episodes like this one. Thanks for watching Horrors in History.